So glad you're back with us at goldseek.com radio for another Gold Nugget segment. Today's special guest, Dr. Mark Faber, editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report. Well, last week, Federal Reserve governors offered mixed signals regarding quantitative easing plans. My featured guest says it's a bluff. The Fed wouldn't dare to withdraw the liquidity punch bowl. Dr. Mark Faber is an acclaimed economist with considerable savoir-faire, author, editor, and publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom report at gloomboomdoom.com. Welcome back, Dr. Faber. Last week, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York President William Dudley called the U.S. economic recovery tenuous, warning of a premature rate hike. In stark contrast of this dovish talk, Bank of Richmond President Jeffrey Lacker said that interest rate increases were likely later this year and that the federal bank should reconsider quantitative easing two plans to purchase $600 billion in treasuries. Who will ultimately be proven correct and why, sir? In other words, in June it will be finished, and that afterwards they will be waiting to see how the bond market reacts to less purchases or no more purchases of Treasury bonds by the Fed, because it's not evident that the bond market will necessarily go down because of the withdrawal of QE2, uh, because last April, in April 2010, we had the end of QE1, and after that, the bond market actually rallied until August. So the Fed may not immediately announce QE3, but I think eventually it will happen. And concerning rates, they will make sure that the Fed fund rate stays below the rate of inflation. And as you know, the rate of inflation in the U.S. is much higher than what the government is publishing. You know, according to last week's Labor Department report, 216,000 new jobs were created. That was better than expected. It dropped the unemployment rate down to 8.8%. Unemployment is down. The stock market is up. Will the Fed really risk rate hikes in QE3 under such recovery conditions? I think the, the Fed will not implement QE3 for the time being. But if the stock market should go down by 10, 20 percent, for sure, QE3 will come about again. In a related market, King Copper is oftentimes viewed by many as a leading economic indicator. In the past month or so, the market has underperformed relative to competing asset classes. You've gone on record as saying that this could be an ominous sign for the riskier assets. Do you expect investors to lose their risk appetite later this spring? Well, I mean, markets never move in one direction consistently. There are always corrections, and we had in 2010 a correction in the S&P from April 23 when the S&P was at 1219. We then went down to 1010 on July 1st, so we were down essentially 20%. And I would expect a similar correction to happen in the very near future. In fact, I think that the market is a, very, very overbought right now, and a lot of stocks have failed to make new highs recently. They look like topping out, including also a commodity like copper. So overall, I wouldn't think that the market has much upside potential right now. You know, according to the mainline media, investors are concerned that geopolitical unrest in North Africa and the Middle East, it's going to curtail oil shipments. Do you see continued geopolitical unrest in the region eventually putting upward pressure on crude oil? Well, I think that there is a risk that the unrest or the civil war in Libya can escalate because who knows, maybe somebody around the world will support Gaddafi. It's not crystal clear that he will be all the time all by himself. Secondly, and more worrisome, is probably Yemen, where you have essentially 
a vicious leader, as bad as Gaddafi is, and you have an opposition that is very hostile to both the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. And that could become a, a trouble spot because strategically, Yemen is, of course, much more important than, say, Libya. Speaking of the energy market, you know, the natural gas sector is notorious for wild price swings. For nearly three years, though, price has been stubbornly subdued here near the credit crisis lows. Yet with crude oil soaring above $100 per barrel on its way perhaps to 120 and beyond, do you think a sympathy move in natural gas is plausible? The price of natural gas is incredibly depressed. It may stay depressed for a while, but it won't be depressed forever. And uh, I've been actually recommending to accumulate natural gas-related equities. And, of course, I always hear, yeah, there is a glut of uh, natural gas. But to these people, I always say, yeah, when I recommended to buy cotton, there was also a glut of cotton when cotton prices were around 50 cents a pound. Now they're over $2. So you have to essentially buy these commodities when there is a glut, when there is oversupply, and when there are shortages, you liquidate the positions or reduce the positions. And so on that basis, I think that natural gas is attractive. Aside from that, say, the spread between natural gas and crude oil is at the record. Exactly. I wonder if we could move on to another commodity that's near and dear to you, and that, of course, precious metals. You know, gold and particularly silver remain the investments du jour as investors search for financial life preservers amid this geoeconomic uncertainty, as well as continued inflation concerns. Do you expect 2011 to be another winning year? Yes, I think so. But, I mean, we had recently a breakout move in gold over 1425 and in my opinion it's more like an extension move than a genuine new upward move so i think investors as i always have maintained for the last 11 years they should gradually and every month buy some gold but if someone says to me is it, is it today an ideal entry point into the gold market, I would tell him probably not. It may also undergo a correction at some point. You know, during your speaking engagements, I've read that you sometimes ask attendees to raise their hands for an ad hoc poll regarding gold and silver ownership. Would you please tell us the findings of your informal surveys? Well, basically, I attend quite a few investment seminars worldwide, and uh, on most occasions, I will ask the audience, you know, who of you has more than 5% of your money in gold? And usually it's like maximum 3% of the audience. I was uh, not long ago in Korea. There were uh, about 1,000 people attending, and not one had gold. So, I mean, when people say that gold is a bubble, I don't think so. I think it's rather under-owned by most investors. Sir, as we wrap up this discussion, I'd like to give you a chance to share any other areas that are hot spots that you are watching closely or perhaps another market that you think looks attractive in the months going forward. Well, I mean, I still like energy shares because I take two perspectives. One would be that the optimists are right and everything will be fine in the world and there won't be any geopolitical problems and there won't be any economic problems thanks to our genius Mr. Obama and other genius Mr. Bernanke and so we have a beautiful growing global economy in which case the demand for oil will of course go up and have an impact on the price of oil that is likely to be to push it up. Or you take the ultra bearish view about the world where the Middle East will go up in flames, where geopolitical problems spread, and where there will be more money printing. And in this environment, I think oil will also go up because of money printing, 
and because of supply interruption. So I think from a risk-reward point of view, oil is probably still quite desirable. For listeners who would like to learn more about your flagship periodical, the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report, please tell them where to direct their web browsers and any other pertinent information. Well, the website is called www.gloomboomdoom.com, all in one word. Very good. Well, sir, we can't thank you enough. Bye-bye, thank you.